everyone, this is PirateMonkey64 recording the very first chapter of the novel Saving Zim by Dibbo7. Huge fan of their stories, and I'm so excited to be doing this. Let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 1 The Call Dib was out on his balcony, filling his time with his usual habitual reveries. The stars never failed to fascinate him or make him feel woefully insignificant. To Zim, the stars did not endow him with the same sense of mystic awe. To him, there was as mundane as traffic was to Dib, and they never sullied the human's lore. Whenever he could, and if it was a clear cloudless night with the moon being particularly bright, he'd go and stand on his balcony, smoking a cigarette or drinking a can of beer. Sim had once laughed, saying the human pollution blotted out the full orchestra of the planets and stars, and did believe him. Only once had he ridden in Zim's boot, and he'd seen the stars for what they truly were, unhindered and unmolested by the Earth's pollution. His eyes had ached from looking at so many celestial balls of light. Now he was quite happy to admire them from his home as his glass lenses reflected their fiery white light. His home was situated on a quiet rural town where not much happened. The traffic was light, and his neighbors couldn't even be seen over the brow of the hill. On one side of him was a great forest, and opposite of him was a cornfield. He liked it here, and he liked the serenity the place possessed. No more city life for him. Of course, the main town was only five miles away, and he went there regularly for business and pleasure. Zim's culture sack was exactly three miles behind him, so in a way they were now living closer. In the parlor, the TV was comfortably playing away, its blue light enveloping the empty sofa in front of it. The room was in a bit of a mess. Countless UFO magazines were haphazardly strewn all over the coffee table, a table littered with old liquid stains. Old popcorn kernels had been distributed over the rug, and his hanging shelves were dusty and cluttered with memorabilia, with the occasional cobweb making its debut in the parlor room corners. Living as a full-time bachelor had made him indulgent and lazy with his housekeeping. Yes, he was a student proper when it came to his job. He carried professionalism around with him as if he coined the term. But when it came to private living, he stopped caring as soon as he'd entered the threshold to his own domain. Perhaps it was a man thing. Perhaps it was a symptom of loneliness. Either way, he didn't have a measure of care. As he was inching a fresh cigarette out of its packaging, the TV screen suddenly flickered violently, and the voices became a distorted mess of noise. Dib spun around, sure it was on the fritz. Yet how could it be? He just bought the widescreen TV a year ago. It wasn't even past its warranty. As he'd still be musing this, the lights flickered simultaneously and then died, filling the whole house with an ill blackness. The TV keeled over as well, leaving Dib in darkness. Hastily, he rummaged for the library he usually kept in his left jacket pocket. With nervous fingers, he found it and pulled it out. He flipped open the lid, and the small orange flame bloomed upward like a flower. It doused his face in a lambent glow. His eyes tried to scan the dark for foul play. The house seemed to glare silently back at him, as hushed as a tomb. It was not unusual for rural areas to suffer blackouts, but being Dib, he had always had reservations when suspicious things started happening to him. The flicking lighter flame could not reach very far. He trod on ahead carefully in his light little bubble, step by step, trying to remember where all the furniture was situated so that he wouldn't stumble and fall into anything. Was there an intruder? Or a simple fault in his electricity? The fuse box was down in his basement. He never liked going down there. It was the last place left to renovate, and it would be the most expensive. For it was damp, and quite big for what it was. He only ever stored alcohol down there, and the useless cardboard boxes for storing away old CDs and other junks from when he was a kid. As usual, however, when something untoward happened, his first culprit was always that alien. Zim? He called impatiently. Zim, are you in here? If you are, this is not funny. He tried to get angry. Truth was, he was shivering in his pants, and it was hard to convey one's voice when he was pretty shook up. He hated being blinded, and hated feeling vulnerable, especially in his own house. Zim didn't usually strike this close to home, but he did know where Dib lived, and not everything the yelling did was coherent or plausible in any way. Zim? He yelled at this time, growing more impatient and frightened. Come out this second, or I'm calling the cops! Suddenly, as if by magic, the lights flared back to life, filling Dib's vision in white. He had to throw a hand up in front of his face to allay the torturously bright intensity. As if in union, the TV sprung back to light too, and a female reporter was back on Channel 5, highlighting the recent rise in food prices. All was well again, just as before, as if nothing foreboding had ever transpired. Dib peered around his own parlor nervously, the lighter still flickering away. Anxiously, Dib jabbed a cigarette between his lips and lit the tip before putting the lighter away. Zim? He called again, this time with far less anger. Zim, you there? There was not a sound. He inhaled on his cigarette, and the intoxicating fumes helped his nerves relax. Outside, he could distinctly hear car alarms going off. Not just one or two either, but at least half a dozen. Still, he roamed forwards, thinking about grabbing a knife from the kitchen drawer. He floated from place to place, tense and ready for a fight. Each time he came to the room and swung the door open, ready to take a swing, he confronted an empty room. All the windows were shut, and his back and front doors were still locked. Of course, windows and doors had never posed much of a problem to the alien baiter, but still. He was about to decide that the whole thing had been nothing but a simple, innocent blackout when, in the parlor, the phone had begun to ring. He inwardly groaned. Probably, Probably salespeople ringing up, wanting my details, my details for something, for something I, don't I don't need. He checked his wristwatch. It was late. No one he knew would ring at this time. Sometimes his dad ran late on occasion when he was excited about some new invention that he couldn't hold in any longer. He ignored the first few rings, relying on the answering machine to follow through and have the recipient leave a recorded message. But the recipient left no message, and in the space of ten seconds it started ringing again. 
Dip hardly ignored someone who was trying to get through to him twice. So, with a hard sigh, he walked on over with the limp cigarette dangling from his lips and picked it up. Yeah, hello? Member in residence. Um, yes, hello? The voice sounded tinny and very familiar. Um, is this Dib? The caller sounded like he was struggling with his words. Dib frowned. Was this a prank caller? Yes, it is he. Who is this? It's Gurr. Gurr? Zim's robot dog thingy? Now Dib was surprised. It was rare, doubly rare for Gurr to have anything to do with him, let alone coherently make a phone call to his house. He still had his doubts and suspected a trap. Um, you need to come over. My master spilled his sauce everywhere. I'm worried. Someone could slip on it. Sauce? Jesus, Gurr, is that all? Sauce? This is ridiculous. Why would he care? Just clean it up. I can't. Now Gurr was beginning to sound frustrated as if robots could even get frustrated. It keeps coming out. What does? The sauce. Look, is Zim there? Can I talk to him? What Gurr had to say was usually dribble anyway. Talking to him was like trying to reason with a madman. It just gave Dib a headache. Yes? Then, no. Gurr, just clean it up. I have better things to do. No, wait! And Dib hung up. Jesus, talk about wasting his time. He walked back out through his open door to the balcony, enjoying his cigarette until it had turned into a stub. Then he flicked it over the balcony. Sauce. What a load of baloney. But Gurr's tone did worry him. It had a hue of panic to it. I can't keep going there every time Gurr rings me up about something stupid. His mind toyed with the idea of going over just to see if one of Zim's plants had combusted, perhaps showering sauce or ignition fuel all over the place. It would come as no surprise. Zim rushed through his plants as if his biological clock was on the brink, and his final products would end up as mighty big failures. The trip would just take me 15 minutes, less if I take the shortcut. Can I be bothered, though? He looked at the phone back in the parlor. Soft unease had started in his heart. Then before he knew it, his body was on the move, and he was grabbing his coat and car keys. Stupid, stupid machinery. He was down in his pack, which he hated. And though his place was kept as sterile as possible from unhealthy obsession, the floor still proved to be less savory than any other surface, and he had to lie on it. It presented a lot of dust, and though his base was well ventilated and sealed tight against the airborne spores of humanity and all they produced, dust still made its way down into the catacombs of his nest. Using his receptor grapplers, he sought the problem in the dark beneath his console and set about to fixing it. The wires were seed in rubbery ploxum, an urchin material much like rubber, yet thicker, more resilient, and stronger. He slipped some of it away to get at the coils within. One of the wires wasn't connecting properly. Must have been a fault when the machinery was installed or some recent power surge had caught something to burn up. He squinted one fuchsia eye at the problem, even though he had no trouble seeing in the dark in the carnivorous confines below his console. The faulty wire in question was easy to pinpoint. The silvery trim was blackened and slightly out of shape amongst the others. Zim cut away the damaged section with careful precision and let the piece fall into his uniform before he carefully slipped in a new piece of wire after cutting it to fit. Then he carefully backed up, sliding along the floor on his pack. It was a bad habit to practice, one that would surely cause Urkinolites to frown upon. He coasted back into the light and rolled over onto his side. Folding up his knees underneath him, he tried to stand. His knees ached and his back hurt from straining so long under the console in an awkward position. Grabbing the edge of the console for support, he levered himself back up, feeling the pressure ease from his joints. Computer, he barked. Re-establish connection and run the drives. He was pretty sure the Bodge job had fixed the problem. He wasn't a qualified Urkin engineer, but he was able to make and fix whatever he could, sometimes out of very limited resources. It was not wise to rely entirely on machines that could break down and leave him in the dark. Invaders had to be resourceful, after all. Re-establishing Link, drummed the computer. Zim stood, staring at the screen as Urkin Jargon rolled upwards in streams. His antenna, one crooked, the other perfectly smooth, lay across the flat of his head as he tried to relax. But his body remained stiff and rigid, a posture he'd held almost all his life without even making a conscious effort to realize that he was doing it. Gurr, his deranged Sir Robot unit, plodded into the room holding an armful of supermarket products. I got the shampoo! Let's turn the taps on! Zim would become a reluctant expert at understanding Gurr's mangled speeches and answered with bitter promptness. Does it look like I need a bath, Gurr? I'd just go and watch TV or something. I have work to do. He could have rebuked him in Urkin. He hadn't spoken in his native tongue for over 12 years and it bothered him. He did not want his own language to go rusty and forgotten. Already in his head he thought in English, and though he hated this unplanned arrangement, he couldn't help himself. Without hearing another fellow Urkin speak, he was slowly losing touch with his own kind. How did it come, did to, it this? come to this? He jerked himself from this dangerous reverie. Urkins had never been taught or trained to reflect or daydream. It was a waste of time. Computer, download a diagnostic report. Suddenly everything went down. The computer hummed in a low drone as all power drained from its processors, and the screen reeled into a very alarming black. As Zim pondered this, panic freshly knocking on his door, the lights went out. Everything went out. Even Zim's pack. The power outage phased Zim only a little, the lack of lights even less, for he could see and feel his way in the dark perfectly, but it was the failure in his pack that frightened him the most. Usually bringing with pink light, the metal dome on his back also dimmed, and then faded to gray, as made his heart faltered. Gurr, help me! The power is out. I need the facility back online. He could not have caused such a massive blackout, surely. His repairs had been minor. He'd been nowhere near the main power circuits. 
Gur! He cried when his first shout was not reciprocated. He could see Gur in the dark, not much further from where he'd originally been standing before the power failure. But as he turned to Zim, his attention decidedly elsewhere. The Irkin Elite saw that Gur's eyes were red. Gur, stop staring and help your master. I need you to go back to the power core and see if it's still in line. We have ten minutes, Gur. He himself, ever the hard worker, was already on the next task. Mentally employing the mechanism that held his pack in place inside his spine, he lodged it free so it disengaged from his body. His telekinesis was rare for Urkins, and some possessed higher abilities than others. Zim's telekinesis was weak at best, but it was just strong enough to manually manipulate his pack to and from his body, whereas some Urkins, like Tech, had a far higher mental capacity for psychic management. Before the pack could drop to the floor, he grabbed it and brought it over to his console to begin diagnostics. Luckily, the laser gun had been charged this morning, or he may not have been able to use it at all. McGurr had other things on his mind. He approached Zim quite naturally as if he was about to impart a line of dialogue. Zim was not paying any attention, and his left claw was a laser gun. He was busy lifting off the top lid of his pack to get at its circuitry. Yes, Gur, I gave you an order. This is important. Now go! If he could go back in time, he wished he had paid better attention. Gur flexed his metal fingers together to form a blade, and then he thrust it deep into Zim's side as quick as a bullet. The blade of fingers punctured flesh with ease, and before Zim even realized, Gur had yanked his hand back out again, allowing blood to drench the floor beneath. More blood spurted down Zim's uniform and all over his boots. The Urkin just stood there, too horrified to even scream. Then the lights flickered back on. The main computer hummed into life and the pack lit up. Even Gur's bright red eyes turned back to their charming sign color. Master? Master, what you do? You got icky sauce all over you. Zim swallowed and felt his breath run down his throat where his little lungs started hitching out wheezes. He staggered backwards and pressed a glove claw to his side. Hot, iridescent fluid kept lugging out with each beat of his heart. Before pain and numbing shock could outrace him, he quickly turned around and mentally clawed for his pack beneath the clamor of his own panic. He was rewarded by its comforting presence as it lifted upward, its flat inner disc facing his spine. Tubes extended from its base like twin tongues, and once again these interconnected with the tubes from his spine that protruded outwards to greet it. Once whole again, the pack sunk deep into his nervous system and started sending out electric signals to his body to begin biological repair. Even so, Zim, cold and hazy with blood loss, squatted where he was. Both hands pressed to his wound as blood oozed out between his claws. Gur stood by him, unmoving and giddy with concern. Master, did you hurt yourself? Should I get help? I know you like pancakes. That'll make you feel better. Zim couldn't believe it. He was so pain-induced and so compressed with shock that he'd hardly given Gur much thought. The Sir's unit act of untoward aggression had to be a mistake, miscalculation. Gur had never done anything of the like before, except for that one day when Zim tried to keep him permanently locked to duty mode. But that was many, many years ago. Gur... His words were slurred, his brain in a haze of absolute pain. His pack was busy filling his chemistry with pain blockers, and it was making him feel tired and disoriented. To a human, they would be feeling pretty drunk at this point. Do you recall the last five minutes? Activate your memory banks. Gur thought for a moment. This idle posturing was more suited to something with sentient qualities than robotic. Zim watched, still squatting on the floor. It was much too painful yet to sit, and much too painful to flatten himself to the ground. He wasn't sure how deep Gur had managed to go in. Was this spooch in jeopardy? Or was it just a flesh wound? His pack was burning with activity as it hastened to still the blood loss, arrest the pain, and secure the site from infection. But it would take longer for the actual wound to close. First it had to codulate, and that could take a few minutes. Nope, sorry, nothing there, the robot concluded at last. Zim took a moment to breathe out. It felt like he had a thousand stinging nettles all lodged in his bleeding side. Hot blood still caressed his fingers. He was pretty sure he'd lose consciousness. The world was starting to fade in and out, much like one of the human movies he had watched on occasion. And even Gur, once crystal clear, was now turning into a blurry outline. C could you just... maybe? He felt his heart stagger and lurch as if the very blood it was trying to pump out was now nothing but air. The whole base around him was now transforming into a dark swab of gray. Was it another blackout? Or was it he who was blacking out? Master? Gur whinnied like a puppy. Master, master, open your eyes! Don't be sad. I'm sorry! It was the last thing he heard. In order to save energy to protect its host, the pack had put him to sleep. And that concludes chapter one. I had a very fun time recording this, as it's, I've never done anything like this before. If you want to hear more, please let me know. This fanfic's a wonderful piece of the Zim fandom. I'd like to thank Divo7 for their support throughout this. Though Saving Zim does not belong to me, I highly recommend you check out their fanfiction. Trust me, it's worth it. Anyway, hope you all have a lovely day.